the sound. Hello, I'm Deborah Davis, director of the Valdosta State University Archives and Special Collections. Sounds and good. And I'm Ashley Braswell, the Is director the of the sound Academy okay? Of Lingo, yes, yes, it sounds good. Today we're going to talk to you about a collaboration between a museum and an archives to document African American history. We're going to do it more as a conversation with our slides, more like an interview, so we hope you enjoy this format. Hey Ashley, I'd like to talk to you about Roy Copeland, his success, and his position in the community. Sure. So Roy is a very experienced trial lawyer with 30 years of experience in that field. He's also a very dedicated professor at Valdosta State University who genuinely cares about his students as well as extremely active in the community through 100 Black Men and other activities. Yeah. And he's a character. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about Roy and Cheryl, who they are, their education work, and a little more about their place at VSU. So they are both wonderful people. Um, they have been extremely active in their community. Um, both um, educationally went on to do their undergraduate, their master's, and their doctorate degrees, um, in which he went into law and she went into education. She was a teacher and then eventually retired as a principal of a local, of a local school system. Great. All right. I want you to talk a bit about how he acquired the collection. How did he get started collecting in the first place? So that's actually a funny story. Uh, he told his wife, Cheryl, many, many years ago, back in 1989, that he didn't want anything for Christmas. And so she decided she was not taking that and she bought the first piece of their collection, which was a, an autographed pair of boxing gloves by Muhammad Ali that happened to be his favorite. favorite. Yeah, he really <laughs> likes Muhammad Ali. Yes, he does. There are 76 current pieces in the collection and they came in ready for display. You see that there are, there's a picture of the person that's being documented. There's the item that is old that is the primary source document that was collected and then there's the note to contextualize it and give you background so this is not all materials are like that you have to do signage for some but this is a very easy collection to work with all right, tell us about the Harley Langdale College of Business and why you wanted to give the collection to the school and how the school decided there would be a museum. Sure, so this collection had revolved around the state for many years prior to coming to the College of Business, but because Dr. Copeland was a professor there and still is, he had an affinity to the College of Business and decided that this is the home he wanted it to have. So the then Dean, Dr. Wayne Plumley, started working with administration to identify a location for the permanent home of this museum. The Copeland's hope was that their dining room table could extend to the community, and this was a great way to involve the campus as well as our community members. All right, the Valdosta State University Archives and Collections collects broadly across the VSU Record Group South Georgia and Georgia collections, which most have a link to South Georgia. And we also collect items and collections that support curriculum. For the past 10 to 15 years, we have tried to acquire collections relating to African American history. The school is 35 to 40 percent African American, and when I took over the archives, there were only two collections even remotely related to African Americans in the archives. Hold on, I'm putting on my mask. I wanted the archives collections to reflect the student body. We now have 25 excellent collections related to African American history and culture, and some of these are quite large. Some of these collections have been donated and some we have purchased. We also spend about two-thirds of our special collections book and paper budget on African-American history. 
So we have added a lot of books and rare items, many of which we have digitized. Since integration in 1963, more of our collections in the VSU Repker group reflect our more diverse student body. But unfortunately, our well-documented collections in this record group skew prior to integration. We also have a large art collection and have made an active effort to collect art by and relating to African Americans. We even commissioned a piece for the library by a nationally known African American artist. The Copeland Collection is by far the most versatile and interesting collection we have taken in. And this is changing a lot of what we have to offer. A loan is an unusual stipulation for an archives. Many archives do not take loans, and for a good reason. The loaned items take up space and processing time and don't have a permanent place in the collection. They can be removed at any time. Because of the topic and value of this collection, and because we were the obvious choice to care for the collection, we were happy to agree to a loan, with stipulation that the materials could be used outside museum display. Also, because this we were within the school, and this was another section of the university, it was more likely that this museum would be, this collection would be permanently housed in the archives. So it was less of a risk to take it as a loan. The archives has done a complete processing of the collection into a finding aid on archive space. For the first two years that had things coming in and not being displayed in the museum, we kept the collection separate with descriptions and photographs only available in the archives. However, we have clarified our position by use outside the museum, and even items not on display are available for study and viewing in the archives and are in active use with history classes for primary source research and for other displays. We added descriptive information for each item, as you can see there. Um, as well as a digital object so that people can view the complete collection of items outside the museum. Here is a version of a digital object from our archive space archival management system. The pictures are not professional quality but should give someone an idea if they want to see the physical object. These things are bulky they're stored in big boxes, so we only take them out when people have a real reason to see them. All items are marked as on display in the finding aid when they're in the museum and in archives with a vault location when they're not. Again, note the framed display. There are the cufflinks, there's the discussion of the cufflinks, if you've worked with exhibits before, you know how hard it is to, com to compile this information. So having it already done makes it easy for us to describe it and makes it easy for us to use in the museum. And having those framed also as they come in saved a lot of expense to both archives and the museum. Yes, and it makes switching out the collections so much easier. Yes. <laughs> really much easier. <laughs> Um, we also have invoices and certificates of authentic authentication linked, but only in the staff view of most of the collection. More of this information comes in all of the time. This is an open collection, and we're expecting another 30 items this semester alone. Dr. Copeland is still actively collecting, so we are still actively describing and photographing. The archives also has the right to use the collections for display outside the museum, and we have put up pieces of it period periodically in some of our display cases. 
Prior to the museum's opening, we used a display to introduce the idea of the collection and the idea of the museum to the campus this way. We, when we decide to do an exhibit with this material, we confer with Ashley, she comes over, we scout the possible locations, we scout the security, and we make a decision about where these items are going together. Okay, how did you start with the idea of a museum? How did he kind of want to do that? Why did he want a museum? Sure, so he and his wife were getting to the point of retirement and they wanted to make sure that all of the educational pieces that their family had enjoyed for many years became part of our community. So they approached us around the end of 2016 with the possibility of this gift. And at the completion of that meeting, I immediately called our archivist, Deborah Davis, so that we could sit down and talk about all of the things that we would need to do in identifying and constructing a space that was not only safe, but the lighting was appropriate, the air was kept at the right level, and that we could maintain the gift that we had been entrusted to. Yes, uh, about 10 years earlier, prior to this, we had created a museum within the library to tell 100 years of the history of the college. So I had experience with this, I had experience adjusting the lighting, filtering the cases, doing a whole lot of stuff that came in handy when we wanted to do this museum. Absolutely. All right, we're going to play a video now that gives you a vision of the museum. My name is Roy Copeland. I'm an Associate Professor of Management at Valdosta State University. This collection belongs to the community. What you see here is maybe about one-third of the entire collection. I think it's important that we have kids come through this museum and learn a little more about African American history. Obviously, they're iconic figures, um, starting from the very beginning um, of enslavement of African Americans in this country. Uh, going up through the present day with Barack Obama and every person in between. You know, when we talk about <clears throat> this city, this state, this nation, it's about all people and the stories of all people individually and collectively should be shared. With this project, there are several folks who contributed mightily to ensure that it happened, but not just happened but it happened at a level where it is something that we can all say, this is a job well done. You will leave with something that perhaps you didn't know before, and that's what knowledge is all about, learning something and building on it. All right, so we had a vision and we had stuff. And when you create a museum, you have to start with money. So I'd like for you to talk about how you got the funding to even begin to do this. That's a great question. So we had several community members that understood what the vision for the museum was. Um, they were already friends of ours, Valdosta State. And we gathered them together to talk about what this type of space would do, not only for our, for our university, but also for our community, our local school systems, youth groups, all of those types of individuals. And together we talked about the direction and what we needed to do. And those are the very individuals that stepped up to the plate and offered um, financial support, giving us the ability to create that renovation, specific to what the museum needed to be not only successful, but to safeguard the items that would be contained within the museum. Six of those, and you see those six um, groups or individuals on the screen, um, gave $7,500 each to support the efforts of the renovation, and then one of the six gave an in-kind gift of around fifteen dollars to $20,000 to provide all of the lighting 
that would provide that safe illumination for the pieces that were held within. And the Harley Langdale Junior College of Business and VSU also put in a good bit of money for the renovation and things like that? Um, not so much in money for renovation. Um, that was actually handled by these individuals, but they provided a space which does equate to, you know, supporting the museum's efforts. Um, that also involved campus police in monitoring that space. It also included having the archivist. So if you take the monetarial value of the things that were incorporated into that, it's a significant gift. Yes. All right. Um, we built the museum as a committee. I brought in experience on display and appropriate preservation issues involving displays and generally how to get such things done on campus. Who do you call? How do you hang it? Um, things like that. Um, one of the things that was important was creating an invitation to come in. The museum had to have an identity as soon as you walked in the door. And tell us about the care that was taken and what you did to create that introductory space. Absolutely. So as you see on the screen, it is a fabulous picture of the Tuskegee Airmen. And I must say, it's quite difficult to blow a picture up from that time frame to 99 by 101. Um, certainly maintaining the, the, the um, credibility of the original image. So that, that picture was reduced to a 78% so that we could have the, the normal flaws from that time frame, but not pixelating that picture. I think what's so interesting about the entrance to the museum is we originally selected that piece because of what the Tuskegee Airmen stood for, the valor, the honor, the patriotism. We did not know that one of the individuals in that picture was actually the cousin of Dr. Copeland's father. Merrill Ca Major Carroll Woods is, and you can't see him because of this gentleman, but he's the second from the left. So once we found that out, the picture take, took on a life of its own, and it was a must keep for the entrance. Yes, and there's various other things. There's like a list of the donors. There's some biographical information about the Copelands. That's right. There is a panel from the History of VSU Museum that we did. We reproduced the panel that tells about the story of integration yes. at the college. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things just as you walk in before you get to the actual collection. One of the things that they did was incorporate AV. So can you tell about some of the challenges and things yes. that you did? <laughs> so um, incorporating the AV was an, uh, it was an attempt to bring the way that people learn all into one space, whether you're auditory or visual, whatever that looks like. The AV system correlates with pieces that are in the space. So you could actually walk over and see the, the guitar signed by B.B. King and then come over to the interactive space and listen to him play that same guitar. So it was a great way to engage people with more than just their eyes, but certainly technology comes with complications sometimes. And as we were trying to save a little bit of money, we moved an original um, smart TV from our conference room in the Dean's conference space and it broke right after the grand opening. <laughs> so we did end up having to purchase a new one. Um, I would say probably the other thing that was tedious was how you gather the licensing that gives you the opportunity to be able to show those videos. And so we went through educational licensing, which gave us the opportunity to provide a lot of material while still staying within you know, what is appropriate for VSU. An appropriate cost. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, marketing the museum was a challenge and a necessity. So um, what about the initial steps and how did you get into USA Today? So we had a wonderful graduate assistant that she spent a lot of time in the beginning making sure that we had the opportunity to enlarge the footprint of the museum and she was you know, 
very effective in reaching out to some of those regional um, marketing opportunities and, and drawing attention to our museum here in South Georgia. Um, we had a lot of local coverage, but we were, like as you said, successful in getting in USA Today that was actually a Black History Month edition. So that was great for us. We also had representation in the, the Tennessee Tribune, Georgia Magazine, and others like that. It, um, it's important because with our campus, a museum is not traditional. It's a college of business. So making sure that people know that we are there and we want them to come visit was imperative. All right, this shows that it was known around the state, that it got introduced around the state. And Ashley has addressed that a little bit, but we wanted to show that it appeared in statewide publications. And one thing about this museum, Valdosta State is primarily located in a location on North Patterson Street. However, a mile to a mile and a half away is another campus that originally started as Emory Junior College and when that closed that location came to Valdosta State and it's for the business school, the nursing school, but it's not close. So when most people think of coming to Valdosta State, they think of coming to the main campus, not the north campus. So we had to give the north campus some identity other than the business school. That's right, that's right. And tell us a little bit about all this, the different ways you marketed. So I think that it's important to have a layered approach when marketing, and as you can see by the list, um, there's lots of different ways that we did that, you know, both through media outlets, through student organizations, through marketing through athletics, and through classes. And I think when you look at some of those layers, especially when it's student types of organizations and athletics, you have the opportunity to overlap circles of influence. So as you bring in student organizations, we ask them to share that on their social media, to share that amongst their friend groups, as well as with athletics. Lots of other, you know, or lots of other kids follow these individuals and so word of mouth is a great way to promote what is actually on their campus. We actually had bus systems where we had marketing in each bus. So every time a student got on and off the bus, there was the Copeland African American Museum name and opportunities so that maybe that would bring them to North Campus to see what we had going on. Yeah, that was that was a great idea. I got tons of ideas and <laughs> felt really bad but because we have marketed our museum locally and regionally to the South Georgia Museum, but we never did anything like this. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, let's talk a little bit about the grand opening. Mm -hmm. So that was a great day. We um, had previously had a soft opening on November 1st, and this was our day to actually open to the public. And so we welcomed a Valdosta native, Josh Harvey Clemens, back to campus to help us really talk to the students and tell them why a space like this is important. He um, talked to them and said, this is a space where you can come in and see that no matter what barrier is in front of you, based on the people that you're witnessing in this museum, you can overcome anything. And so our community, our, our campus community, joined in the celebration as we cut the ribbon for this wonderful space, and it was open to the public. That is great. Um, here is some early numbers of tours conducted. How did you reach out to these different groups? So, you know, the, the local campus groups were a little bit more easy to reach out to because they're there with us, part of the Blazer Nation family. Um, but again, my graduate assistant and I developed invitations that were sent to the other school systems in our local community, letting them know not only about the museum's existence, 
but that we were open for tours and we would love to become a partner of the teachers, the principals of those schools, and to collaborate in creating an experience that built into the standards and curriculum for the state. Excuse me, I have no idea what that was. Um, one of the early groups was the athletes and you reached out to the athletes in the VSU community how exactly? So we have a wonderful football coach and basketball coach and volleyball coach. They're all very pro VSU. They're also very pro having spaces like this and promoting that to their students. So it was a really easy phone call conversation where we said, hey, we're here. We'd love to host your group. Obviously, this was during the pandemic, um, the first round of it, and so this gave those students that were not able to be competing in their current sports at the time an opportunity to not only support VSU's initiatives, but to come see a piece of history that's so important. Okay, and that right there in between the students is Wood Copeland's father's cousin, yes, right? Now we get a Wood. now we get a good picture yes, of him. Yes. Um, they also had audiences that were very young. What did you do differently for such an audience? So that was really fun. And um, these kids were four and five years old. A lot of them had never been to a museum before. So we called in a retired teacher and said, "Come help us know what we don't know." And we separated the experience into three stations. There was a reading station where the children had a book read to them. There was a coloring station. And then the other group toured the museum. So they had plenty of space. We also used blue painter's tape to create the line in which they should navigate through the museum. And we scooted that back just a little bit. So it was out of arm's reach because we didn't want them to come into the space and tell them, don't touch this. No, don't do this. So at each stop where there was something for them to see, there were little feet on the ground giving them the indication that, hey, stop here. There's something that you need to see. And then in the interactive AV section, we created a kid's corner. So instead of seeing the normal videos that would be witnessed by um, a, a college student or an adult, they watched Sesame Street with B.B. King, and that was a huge hit. That's great. That is great. Um, here's a high school and there's a panel from our museum in the library. Um, how'd you reach the high school groups? So again, this was by efforts of our graduate assistant, but this particular group, they are designated as leaders within their high school. So bringing them over to the museum was kind of a win-win. Obviously, to introduce them to the Copeland Museum, and to um, have them experience it, but for them to help us lead by sharing that this space is available for others to visit. That's great. Tell a little bit about the impact of COVID on the museum. How long were you closed? How did you reopen? Did you do something with social distancing? So COVID was definitely an unexpected issue um, for most, I'm sure. So we, um, our grand opening was January 28th of 2020, and by March we were closed. Um, so what we did was, is we continued to work on a virtual presence so that we could remain relevant given that we were so new. And then when the doors opened back up, about eight months later, we did social distance. Um, the museum at its current state is a quaint space. So we could allow about five people in there at a time while we were social practicing social distancing. Uh, you know, um, it wasn't a pleasant experience, but it certainly helped us to be flexible and fluid. And we put a lot of things in place that should we ever be in that situation again for any reason, we have a little bit more experience under our belt in how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Something else that was created was the Copeland Board of Trustees. Why well, have a Board of Trustees? What do they do? How do you envision them supporting the museum and who's on it? So such an important thing to have in place. They not only guide us and oversee certain practices, but we actually took that board and divided it into positions. 
So we have some members that focus on fundraising, we have some members that focus on marketing, we have some members that focus on, on how we connect to the community and how we can collaborate more with the community. And that board is made up of a mixture of VSU employees as well as community leaders. Um, you know, you're on that board as yeah, well, Deborah. I sit on the board as the archivist and represent the care of the collection and a point of view of teaching faculty using the collections. I'm also on the education committee and there's good synergy because as we plan field trips, we can make them joint field trips. They can go to the museum, they can come to the archives and have like an engagement session with a particular collection and a particular activity and then they can tour campus so we can divide them into thirds and keep things kind of manageable. That's right. Okay. We're in the library, the archives, and have traditionally drawn more activist groups. The college is known as liberal. There are liberal faculty members that get involved in these groups and they bring us to us. We do things that the historical society wouldn't, like researching and representing the Mary Turner lynching. We have an artist's 24 panel rendition of the lynching which took place in Lowndes in Brooks County and we helped uncover that and the story around it. We've had classes do projects that are part of Mary, the Mary Turner's projects work such as transcribing the 1860 slave census for Georgia. We've also done research on the naming of roads for Confederate figures for movements that are trying to change the names of streets and that movement did succeed here in Valdosta. We have um, less contact with mainstream African American community, especially the business community. Partly that's because the Lowndes County Historical Society has a mandate to collect Valdosta and we try not to interfere with that. But the business community has those contacts based on long-term support and projects they have done. And that community, the archives, can never hope to access on its own. So this partnership and work on the board puts us closer to that community in a way we hadn't been before. We made a rule that while the Copeland Collection may be a loan, we would take no more loans on behalf of the museum. Other related material would come into the archives as archival material. Because of the museum, people have approached the museum asking to donate to the museum. Ashley passes them on to the archives and I explain the way items come into the archives and may be used in the museum or may be used in the archives and send them a deed of gift and a digital deed of gift and explain the process. So far in the last four to six months we've been approached four times. We've gotten an autograph collection, a collection of early 20th century racist materials. These would never appear in the museum because they couldn't be contextualized quickly enough to prevent the damage that they would do, especially to an African-American audience. But with a class, you can keep them in a box, contextualize them, prepare people for what they're going to see so that by, time, by the time they open it, they know how to approach this material. We also are in negotiations about a possible large African-American football collection and other single small things. Um, archives also teaches with Copeland materials. Um, we use our 25 collections relating to African-American history. We also use the Copeland collection. We teach a PERS class with the history department, co-teach, called Archives and Librarians for Historians. And the topic is now African-American history in the U.S. It used to be just history generally, and they read around widely. And the main focus was on how to read, how to take notes, how to do research, how to write a thesis statement, how to write a paper, how to do a presentation. And we hoped by doing this to prepare them for their higher level history classes. 
but we had to have content they worked against. And because they were doing papers on civil rights and other things, um, we made this content African American history. And some of them have even taken on the topic of the racist materials collection that we just got in. That's Both great. a white student and a black student, we've been able to contextualize those well. Students do visit the Copeland Museum. They can use stored pieces of the Copeland Museum collection for paper topics, and at least one of our students is doing that. They use our finding aids to study collection items. And we're having Roy Copeland come in. And so it's really helped us with this class. And the teacher that teaches it is a European historian, and I'm an archivist. So we had to teach ourselves African American history, at least the most basic themes and ideas, before we could do this with the class. And it's been very enriching for me to be doing something like this. And the Copeland Museum is what inspired us to do this. Um, we also do public programming. We're planning a lot for African American history. We're each sponsoring programs. The library's putting up a gallery exhibit on African art. Um, what are some of the things? We are working on a Copeland Presents opportunity where there'll be something in the auditorium as far, and you know with a tour of the museum available after that. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer production is coming to Valdosta State so that's an opportunity to share that story and um, as you can see we have a newly NPHC plaza. Yeah that will let's be. talk about that on the next slide. We're also having a daily scavenger hunt with questions that'll bring students to the Museum or to the archives or to other sites on campus. One of the big things that we're trying to do is this National Panhellenic Council, which is African American fraternities and sororities. We're building a plaza. The African American community raised over $130,000 in their goal. 30 days. So the support and interest from the black community is there for something that celebrates black life and uh, achievement. Absolutely. I think, you know, and that's something that you see within the museum too, because accomplishments are being celebrated that may not have been celebrated in the past. Yes. These are current collaborations with, that the Copeland is making. And one of the most important ways this affects the archives is that I also collaborate with these people. As they work with the museum, they also can possibly work with me. I approach the board and other partners with an attitude of advocacy for archives. How can this help the museum and help the archives? I think, you know, when you spread out collaboration opportunities amongst the, the, the campus, it brings innovative ideas from different areas that help, as you said, both archives and the museum. It adds, you know, marketing opportunities that serve as experiential opportunities for our students that better prepare them for the world, while also benefiting the efforts of archives and the museum. All right. Future funding of the museum? Yes, so it's an exciting time. We have current commitments, as you see. Um, Copeland, Hoggerbrook, and Walker have committed to a $50,000 gift in supporting the museum's renovations. We have an anonymous gift of $25,000 that will be coming in in the next couple of weeks. And in-kind gifts are as important. When you see Valdosta Electric Company, they're providing all the lighting for the expansion of the museum, which is a savings of about twenty-five dollars to $30,000. Um, Southern Pediatric Clinic just gave $12,000 to support the new part-time director's position. And I have to say, for the first time on our future opportunities, we have actually gotten a family, well, a friend of the museum to commit to $7,200 a year in perpetuity. 
Oh my gosh, so that is a very exciting gift. We also have a grant, and I'll leave it nameless at this time, that has been accepted and another 25,000 coming in out of our future, future commitments. So we are on our way to sustaining this museum. That's what makes having a director of <laughs> development so important for this project. Okay, so the future. Yes. The future growth of archives for collections, we're very excited about that. And there's future teaching opportunities. We've expanded to teach with, there's a new public history certificate on our campus. And so both of us are working with that professor and with those classes. Um, there's a possible, there's been talk of an oral history project and future story presentations, those oral histories would become part of the archives. It's, it's a great opportunity. There's a lot that can happen with this future opportunity and um, I know that more and more faculty are finding out about ways that they can enrich their students' education through these opportunities. So I'm super excited about the collaboration in the future. And there's also going to be a physical expansion of the museum. There is, yes. It'll be in two phases. The first phase incorporates the internal offices, which will give the museum more um, space to hang more pieces. The idea is to maybe have some spaces that rotate, as the full museum does right now, and maybe some that remain constant, um, giving something new for everyone to see as they come through. And you're working towards an endowment, a director, yes. students from the Copeland Scholarship yes. coming in to do work on it, internships, yes. just there's a whole host of things that are currently in progress yes. that are really going to strengthen the museum as well as strengthening the archives. That's our presentation for today. We'd like to thank you for listening and invite you to contact us. Thank you so much.